We are now entering my favorite part of this course, which is the unit on appetite and appetite regulation. But before we get into some of the more nitty gritty on how appetite is regulated, uh, both uh, centrally and peripherally, there's some, some kind of basics that we need to go over and some terms I need to define. So something important to always mention is that like most processes in the body, appetite regulation is a complex process and there's kind of many competing variables that are, well, competing for whether appetite is promoted or appetite is decreased and something called satiety is promoted. So it's a complex, complex process that, yeah, has a homeostatic uh, part to it where there's lots of internal feedback to the hypothalamus that helps to, in some people more than others, keep appetite and ch in check so we can keep energy in balance. But beyond the homeostatic control of appetite, there's also, like I said, a lot of competing things that affect appetite, like uh, behavioral adaptations, things like reward and food preferences as well. So we're going to explore some of these things. So the main center of appetite regulation is the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. However, that area receives input from a lot of different parts of the body. So we kind of looked at the fact that leptin um, has receptors um, uh, in the arcuate nucleus. Uh, so does insulin, so does cholecystokinin, so does ghrelin, and a lot of other peripheral signals that basically tells the appetite center what's going on peripherally and do I need to eat more or eat less. Okay, and ideally that's all kind of working in balance and we have more of a homeostatic regulation of appetite, but like we said, some signals can override these as well. Okay, so before we get into kind of what can mess with some of these signals, I want you guys to understand the circuitry of the, of the hypothalamus, of the, the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And in particular, we're gonna look at uh, two pathways, which I like to call the eat pathway and the don't eat pathway, or the orexigenic pathway, like the eat pathway, and the anorexigenic pathway, the don't eat pathway. And there is this kind of crop, uh, dual control of appetite based on this um, appetite pathway and this satiety pathway. So we're going to really break that down over the next few modules. Okay. So this is what I mean by that dually controlled appetite center. We, you could, it depends on how it's kind of um, shown. Uh, we can sometimes section this off more into the don't eat side of things or the satiety part of the regulation pathway and more of the appetite or orexigenic part of the pathway. But as you can see, there is cross talk between these two areas. We, by the end of this um, whole unit, I do want you to be able to explain what is found on this slide, but we're gonna go over it more in future uh, modules, okay? So before we get there, a couple terms that I need, or a few terms that I need to define. The term hunger is, like a lot of these terms get used interchangeably, but the term hunger, what it technically means is that physiological drive to consume, like that I need to eat. So your stomach grumbling, feeling kind of low energy, having a headache sometimes, those are all more on the hunger side of things. That said, appetite, we some people define it as like the psychological drive to consume but usually in the literature it's more all-encompassing than that and appetite is just the desire to eat food which can be affected by hunger but we also know that we can have an appetite even when we're not hungry as well okay so anything any kind of sensations or feelings or drives to consume whether or not we're hungry that all falls into the appetite umbrella Okay. The term satiety is used way more than the term satiation, and satiety means uh, the absence of hunger. Some people will use it to describe the period between uh, we finish eating and our next meal. Okay, so how kind of full that last meal left us feeling before we feel hungry again. Okay, some people define satiety as that. Some people will just say it's, it's the absence of hunger period. Okay. Um, that said, some people further differentiate uh, satiety from satiation. Satiation referring more to like what makes us stop eating when we're eating. 
Okay, so when you're eating food, you're maybe hungry at first, and then the more you eat, the more your hunger goes down, which makes you stop eating. That's satiation. You're becoming more and more satiated. Okay, so I find this slide does a good job of explaining those concepts. Um, satiation, again, if this is me eating my meal here, this is my rate of eating here, um, the more satiated I become, the less I tend to eat, and then I stop eating. Okay, and then satiety is at its highest once um, I'm done eating, once I'm full, and that satiety will go down in the minutes and hours uh, following that meal until I would say hunger is about right here, right? When that hunger is what makes us eat again, but also like we know that appetite might make us eat again. And actually I, appetite might occur here, you know, where we actually eat before our satiety has uh, diminished, right? Or we might even eat here. <laughs> we might even eat when we're super full <laughs> and we don't need to eat anymore, but something triggers our eating pattern as well. So I just wanted to differentiate between those terms. Um, some other things that are worth mentioning is that it's very difficult to determine and, and um, assess hunger on its own. It's easier to determine and assess appetite because we can just look at food consumption patterns. Okay, but hunger, how do we differentiate? How do we tease out true hunger and just overall appetite? That's harder to do. So keep that in mind as we learn. Like it says, appetite is more general, and some people argue that we can think of hunger more as an intervening variable that can increase or decrease appetite, okay? What does that mean? When we are food deprived, when we've been exercising a lot, or when our leptin levels are low, we are more likely to have activation of our hunger center, our EAT pathway, as we've learned about with these AGRP neurons. Not just those, but those are often the ones we look at more, more than anything else, okay? So these factors can make us feel hungry and hunger is one of the things that can promote food consumption, okay? That said, I don't actually need hunger for me to see food and eat food. Although if I'm hungry, and I see food, I'm more likely to eat it, okay? But like I said, we all know that a lot of us, you know, we're not hungry, we don't have a physiological drive to consume, but we still see food and we want to consume it. And we might actually work really hard. It's more related to how hard mice work to, to get food, but we might work really hard to get food even again when we're not hungry, okay? But that said, if we are hungry and these things occur and we do see food, right? We might actually work harder to get it, or we might eat a lot more as well, okay? So hunger can influence what we actually do or do not eat, but we don't actually need to be hungry to eat, as we all know, okay? So a few definitions, a few explanations, and then we're going to move on to learn more about the neural control of appetite in the next unit.